Uh, the Stars uh, Secretary. Uh, he joined the BAA in 1975 and uh, a few months later, early 76, began observing uh, variable stars. And for the bulk of the time ever since, uh, he's used binoculars. And there's a very fine photograph, uh, as we um, saw earlier, of uh, uh, Sean with his, I think that's a 20 by 20 by 80, 20 yeah. by 80 binoculars. So, uh, Sean has a very extensive observation program. It just shows you what is possible with, uh, with, with binoculars. Uh, as you heard earlier, he's uh, just achieved his uh, 100,000 uh, 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 milestone. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, Sean, you have a special interest in semi-regular stars. Mm -hmm. This morning, you're going to be speaking about uh, Myra variables. Mm -hmm. Give us a short overview of Myra variables. So, Sean, over to you. Thank you. Myra variables are the longest observed class of star from which we can study their long-term uh, trends and behaviour. They're easy to observe uh, and monitor due to their having some of the largest ranges in amplitude of all variables. Hundreds of them are literally visible in six, eight-inch telescopes. Uh, and many can be observed with binoculars when or near maximum, and there are a few with larger binoculars, for example, uh, Omega, uh, Omicron CTI and TCPI, that you can observe through their entire range. It was a great shame, uh, really, in the 1970s, should we say, that the stars with the how can we put it? The, the ones that like to grab the headlines and, uh, you know, that Gary goes for, they're the, the uh, CVs. And in the meantime, but not, uh, should we say, my variables dropped out of favour. Um, I always remember an article in the BAA journal that talked about period and were the period changes. I think it was probably in about the 1980s uh, as regards stars. Um, up to the 1970s, and included stars like Arbutus, and they were dropped from the program. And it's a shame. And when you come to the end of the talk, you'll understand why I say it's a shame. Um, I'm not going to go through stellar evolution because all I need to say is that they are highly evolved stars, red giant phase, core hydrogen burning isn't taking place, it's shell burning of hydrogen and yes you can occasionally have a helium flash but i'm not going to go into the physics i shall leave that to other people but they undergo self-sustaining pulsations over long periods usually within 80 as a minimum and up to normally about 800 as a maximum uh, the stars expand and contract and combine with this changes in temperature and concentrations of dust and other material means that to the native to visual observers there can be up to 10 magnitudes of variation in a star just for the record in infrared this is less for the simple reason that dust doesn't uh, absorb the light as much in infrared so therefore the range is smaller so this short term is not only the slightest, nothing about the slightest about physics. What we're going to do is we're going to have a look at lots of plots. I would like to thank, I would like to mention the AAVSO for some of the, the, the plots that I've got at the end, and also a Swedish gentleman by the name of Thomas Carlson, whose absolute incredible work in publishing O minus C values and what I've done. He doesn't just do O minus C, he actually does the, it shows how periods have changed. And I think that makes it easier to understand than, than O minus C. Now, when stars tend to have a very short period, for example, here is X cam, which incidentally is the brightest K spectral Myra variable in the sky. It's K when it's brightest, it's red, it's an M star when it's faintest. And as you can see, um, it's over 143 days roughly, and this is a very symmetrical light curve. In other words, if you turned it on its head, it would almost practically look the same. 
because it takes 49% of its time to, from bottom to top, and it takes 51% from top to bottom. So the star is symmetrical in its, um, in, in its shape. Um, yes, it does vary, as you can see. Sometimes it drops below, and I'm trying to read it, but it goes up a magnitude 8. And I think, John, you put a little... You, yeah, you said it's the brightest you've seen you, 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 in 40 years. So actually, um, this is as you go up here. This is this is actually in the 19. This is the 1980s um, when we had a few more observations. But it just shows the broad range. The shortest one we have on our program, as such at the moment, um, fully is this one, and that's S, S Hercules, which goes through its phase uh, in 114 days. So you get over three periods in one year. Again, exceedingly symmetrical, 48% or 55 days to go up, and then 52% of the time to come down. Um, we do have gaps because of Hercules obviously doesn't lie that far away from the um, from the uh, from, from the sun at certain times of year, so therefore we do get, get gaps in observations. As the period increases, so the shape of the curve and different characteristics change, and gradually they become more complex, as you will see. So if we go to the next one, I just want to show you, obviously, uh, a micron cetile, or Myra. Um, and this shows you a typical thing. Again, this is in the 1970s. And as you can see, the actual maximum vary between about two and a half and go down to about magnitude 10. Now, there is a um, com companion to Myra, um, which can affect a little bit uh, to do with the, the uh, minimum brightness of the star. In fact, some people actually suggest that there is some quite rapid uh, variation in Myra at minimum. Um, which may be over the periods of even 20, 30 minutes, it can be picked up, but that may be due to the companion. There was an article on, 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 on that. Um, but Myra, having a longer period of 330 days, so approximately 11 months, um, takes 38% of its time to go from minimum to maximum. So as you can see, you get not only do you get a sharper rise, but if you look, you also get differences in the shape of the star at maximum. Sometimes it can be fainter but have a broad maximum, whereas other times it has a very sharp maximum. Um, so there are different characteristics that you start to get into the system. One of my favorite stars is the next one, which is Tiuma. Um, and that's because it does have quite large ranges. So as you can see, it can reach magnitude 6, and at other times, and it can drop down to magnitude 14. But on other times, you have a minimum of practically 12. Or, as has just happened, the faintest minimum of about, maximum, sorry, of 9.1, 9.2. So Tiuma has, in the last few years, has had a very bright minimum and a very faint maximum. Um, and this was a very bright maximum here. We've had one or two, as you can see. Um, another excellent star to follow and easy to find is Arand. This has a very large range um, between about 14 and a half up to and I think I'm trying to read it there, perhaps somebody can at the angle that I can't. About, it's about six. It can go up to about six, seven, seven in magnitude. But it's a very nice star to follow um, and has, has some variation in its, in its maximum and minimum. It is a longer period of 409 days. Um, the next star I would like to go is the one that perhaps a lot of people this one is one that was dropped, and I've reintroduced it. And perhaps you can understand why I wanted to introduce it. Because the star has 
variation in its light curve. In other words, yes, the star goes, seems to go through periods of a, large, a larger range, and at other periods it has a shorter range. And at the moment, for the last few maximum, SCPI has had a reduce, starting to go through a period where it's got a, a, a shorter range between maximum and minimum. You add to that, there appears to be a general underlying curve to it, like a secondary period that's uh, taking place in that particular star. Um, the next one is one that is very well observed, and it's uh, Chi-Signi. Uh, again, famous because of it can be a very obvious star at certain maximum when it can reach about magnitude 3. Uh, it does drop down to magnitude 14. That's 11 magnitudes in range. So you can go from naked eye to an 8, 10, 10 inch telescope that's needed to observe it. Um, if we zoom in on some of those, you'll notice something happening. And that is what we call a hump or a standstill. On, and generally these occur on the ascending branch. So this is the ascending branch. This is the a descending branch, and uh, the star shows clearly here, 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 and here a uh, irregularity in the rise. And this isn't the most obvious star. I'll come on to some that are more obvious in relation to this. But as you can see, uh, it's a it's an interesting star to follow. At the moment, it's fading down from a maximum. Um, it's probably about magnitude eight, not nine, something like that, I think. Um, but it's got quite a long period of 408 days. It only takes 41% of its time to go from minimum to maximum. Uh, interestingly, it's an S type star, so it's got a spectral class of S, and that is where the proportion of oxygen and carbon are roughly the same, approximately, or literally the same. So it's an S-type star. Um, an excellent star to follow. Sorry, I've added oh, this one's in, sorry. It's in a different order that's down on there, so just ignore me. So this is TCPI. Again, it's another star that, that was dropped. I've reintroduced it. Um, and there are observations of TCPI. Now, this is one of those stars that for a lot of the time you can actually follow with a, a pair of binoculars because it reaches above magnitude 6 and can go down to roughly about 10.5. Um, so it's another star that's worth following. It's circumpolar, uh, the same with T Uma. So you can follow these 12 months of the year. So no gaps. When we look at it closely, with the previous star, you've got a very small little um, dip. As you can see here, you not only get the hump, it actually descends at times. So you can actually, you can, if you look at the photometric observations, although in general, uh, photometric observations will be brighter than visual by an, a small amount, and also that will have a bigger gap usually when it's towards minimum, and that's because of the colour of the star. The cut stars, Myra star variables are more red at minimum. A cat, when you start to come towards a bright maximum, depending on the spectral class, you can actually have them about the same, or even occasionally the visual estimates are brighter. But if you look at this green, you can actually see a dip before it rises again. So it isn't just a general slowdown, it's a can put a, a nice dip and then rise. But each time, look, there's a slightly different shape to the variation. And then you get to RU Hercules, which is probably the, that has a really long sustained hump on its rising branch, as you can see here. In fact, what it means is that, um, that the, from minimum to maximum, is longer than maximum to minimum, but it's but if you could 
take it from there, it would actually be here, but it's because of this. And some suggestions are it may be down to changes in chemical composition in dust or something, and it basically just changes when certain things are at certain temperatures, then you get different chemical compositions and it's either less or more um, transparent. And then you get, and this is start, we could really do with some um, photometric to actually bottom this out because clearly this is not the minimum of this star. This minimum is probably down here at magnitude 17 or, or so. Um, but S sig shows humps, but not on every one. And some stars, if you can see here, it's clear. If I expanded it, it would show more. But you can see one here clearly, but there isn't one there, and there isn't one there. And it comes about one every seven times, about one in every seven um, cycles, uh, shows the hump on its ascending branch. And there's T Cass. Another excellent star, easy to find, again circumpolar, and you can see the hump. Uh, it does have scatter because it's one of those stars that is quite red and different people are well red bright or, or red faint. Um, if you take them out, it actually, the difference, and you, you do an average, you can actually reduce that scatter. And then we come to Arquilla. Um, which uh, this is a recent period uh, chart, and this is up to date, and it shows the bright maximum that we had uh, in December, January, just gone. There's another bright one there as well, back in 2018. But as you can see, uh, you think, well, what's special? What's different about this as a star? Well, now, if we look back to 1910 to 1915, if you look across the bottom, oops, sorry. If you look across the bottom here and you try to work out, you go, oh, that. And that's longer. And in fact, if you then do some period analysis, and this is just to show you what happened. This is, this is just a... a, a a scattering of a few of them. So what we've basically got down here is we've got a micron C tie. And as you can see, so this is going back to 1600 roughly, uh, which is why my variables have said go back further than anyone else. But you can actually see the period was about 331 days. And this is a Myra, and it varies a little bit. Lately, it's gone down. But it's still at two, 326 days, so there's not a great deal of variation. If you go to X, then you've got that goes between about 172 and 182. Not much different. Now we look at our Aquila. And as you can see from there, this has dropped from 300 and uh, I'm trying to see 10, 20, 30, 60, is it? About 360 something days right down to 270 days over the period of time from there to there. That is a huge change in the Myra variable, but it's not the biggest. Let's take a look at this star, which is all, I know this is a very difficult one for us to observe because our Hydra, it is, um, it's a low latitude from this country. So if you go back to the 1920s, 1910s, there were some people set, submitting estimates to the BAA from uh, India, etc. So, But I've gone to the AAVSO, and I'm going to try and speed up so we don't go over. Um, but we've got our hydra there. And as you can see, it's gone from 490 to three below 360. It's a massive decrease. This is a plot, uh, 19, uh, 1920 to 1929. So in addition to the reduction in period, magnitude, about three and a half. Magnitude, 10. Go to now. Magnitude five, 
magnitude 9. So it's reduced by two and a half, degree, two and a half um, magnitudes in range and reduced from 490 down to 300, etc., 370, whatever it was, days. We can look at our centauri if you want to. We can't from here, but it's 570 to 500 days. And that's its chart. Is it? Then, look, you've got a double. The star has developed a, a, two maximum, one bright, one fainter. But it's still classed as a minor variable. LX Cygni. 460 days, 580 days over from 1900, but it, it was a very little change till about 1970. And then in 1970, suddenly something has happened that has caused the period of LXC to increase. And there you have a plot, and it shows typical nine down to about, well, it actually bottoms out, so we're not quite sure where it goes down, but a roughly magnitude 15. Then you're picking up some um, photometry, and as you can see, the range has decreased rapidly um, down to probably magnitude 12 to 15, 16. TY CAS. Um, let's go back. That's gone from 560 up to 660, and back it's going back down to 610. The incident, incidentally, what I should have said with this star is that LX Sig has changed, and might be worth you having a look. Somebody with Spectra, it's changed from an S type star to an SC type star, and now to a carbon star. So spectrally, this star is actually worth taking a look at every so many years to see if we have a change. But I'm going to finish off um, with this star, T Umai. Now T Umai shows here typical Myra variable. What's special about it? I think greatly it goes from magnitude eight and a half to fourteen and a half, so six magnitude range. Doesn't appear to do anything dramatic until you do this. 320, 180. And then you look at the plot of the light curve. Six magnitudes, 1970, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And that's it now. Basically, it's now got two oscillating periods and is a semi irregular variable with a range of about 1, 1.5 magnitudes. So the star is no longer a Myra variable. Will it revert back to being a Myra variable? Or is it, has it, is it no longer a Myra variable? Theory is that R Hydra and R Aquila are similar and undergoing something similar to T Umai, but they're in a different phase, a different portion of that change. LX Cygni, it's deemed to be that they believe that very small changes in the star, in some composition, can affect over a period of time it to a greater extent. Over decades, can it, it can cause changes which appear larger. So in LXIG, it's a different mechan mechanism than it is for these. But uh, is our Hydra and our Aquila are certainly two that are worth following over the next few years to see if the period changes continue or not. And lastly, I'm going to put one up because I know somebody might mention it, and that is this star, which it was a, is listed as a semi-regular SRB, and that's the Zuma, because the period has, uh, sorry, the range has increased and now can go from about magnitude 6 to 10, which means, or even below 10, which means that technically by range it could be a Myra variable. Um, people have different views. Sometimes it shows two, it does show two periods. Uh, whether it is a, a Myra variable or not, or not I don't know. Um, but 
it's certainly a star that worth following. And my final thing and request is that if you observe, and they don't necessarily need to be our stars, but if you, for example, observe UGEM, then why don't you take a look twice a month at S and T gem that happen to be very close by? Or if you observe with binoculars Z Uma, which is the top, literally the top one, then on the same chart is RY, and literally three or four degrees to the uh, east is Y Uma, which has about a magnitude range. Um, so why, when you observe one, please pick up the other two and then it's literally just one minute for each of the stars and there's two extra observations. So it's sort of, should we say, being clever observing so that one there, one there, one there, you can observe a few more and help fill in some of the gaps for us. But I just wanted to give you, my final comment is right at the start, in the first slide was why I love them. And I liken them to this. I want you to imagine that you've got that old friend. And once a year, you meet up with that old friend for a, a meal and a pint, and you have a good chat. And just like that old friend, occasionally they turn up a little bit early. And sometimes they turn up a little bit late. And with Myra's, occasionally they come in and they look a bit subdued and, and they're a bit low and they don't quite reach the brightness that they should. And other times they come in and they're bright and they sparkle because they're full of energy. And just in a blue, once in a blue moon, they turn up as something completely different. So, thank you. Thank you. I know. Well, that's, that's the... Yes. What? Well, yeah, but if you look at LX Sig, it did the opposite. The period increased, but the amplitude decreased. But as I say, that's a different mechanism. In the case of Tu my R Aquila and R Hydra, yes, it appears to be what you've just said. So, which is why those two in particular, and it's worth following the others to other stars over long periods of time, because if we start to pick up on those and the range decreasing or the period decreasing, that's what we need to look at. Um, and and obviously, I would encourage people um, with photometric uh, devices to actually um, time minimum and see if there's changes in minimum.